welcome to Loud and Clear, a podcast dedicated to amplifying the voices of women in music. I'm your host, Olivia Adams, and I'm excited to talk to our guest today, Sandra Mogensen, who is the co-founder of Piano Music She Wrote. If you're not following Piano Music She Wrote on YouTube or Instagram, go fix that. A Canadian of Danish and Latvian heritage, pianist Sandra Mogensen is equally at home in two worlds, performing as a solo pianist and co-performing with singers in recital. She has played in concert in both capacities in Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom, Denmark, Latvia, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, and Austria. In early 2019, Sandra's focus turned to the music of female composers. Her first recording in the series of six albums is known as En Pleine Lumière, which was released in December 2019, spotlighting composers born in mid-1800s. Volume 2, Composers Born in 1870 to 1900, recording sessions have been postponed due to the pandemic. This series of six recordings is of solo piano music by undeservedly overlooked female and female identifying composers of the romantic era up to present day. She has co-founded a project called Piano Music She Wrote in which all piano music on IMSLP composed by women has been cataloged. The Piano Music She Wrote YouTube channel features performances of much of this music as well with a repertoire that continues to expand weekly. In addition, Sandra has also created two directories for those interested in vocal repertoire composed by women, Leaders She Wrote and Melodies She Wrote. Sandra's first solo piano album, Piano Music of Edvard Grieg, recorded in December 2006, was warmly received and praised. Since then, Sandra has become known as a specialist in Greek's music, having released four recordings of the great Norwegian's music so far. Sandra Mogensen has extensive pedagogical experience, both as a piano teacher and a coach for singers. Having taught piano internationally via Skype since 2012, she was well positioned to continue her online teaching when the pandemic situation arose. A former senior member of the RCM Board of Examiners, Sandra is currently an examiner for Conservatory Canada and CNCM. She enjoys adjudicating students of all ages and levels as a way to support and encourage personal and musical development while sharing her love for music. Welcome, Sandra. It's so good to speak with you today. How are you doing? Oh, my goodness. So lovely to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Olivia. Yeah, things are good. (laughs) That's great to hear. So Sandra, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what led you down the path of being a pianist among your many other musical hats? (laughs) Well, that goes way back, I guess. Um, The fact is my mother was a piano teacher, so the piano was just there from day one. Apparently, I, you know, when a, a toddler or a baby learns to walk and they're still holding on to something? What is it called? Cruising, I think. So apparently I did that while playing two finger scales at the piano. So it's just always been part of the environment. Um, And I think I started actual lessons with my mother when I was three. And then my first performance was when I was four in the local music festival. So yeah, it's just what you did in this household. You, you brush your teeth, you read your story before bed, you do your practicing. So um, it's not like I had no choice, but it, it was definitely a big part of, of life. And I do have a very clear memory of being around 15 or so and playing uh, what was then a fairly newly acquired grand piano that, that my mother had bought. In fact, she'd had it, she had bought it in Denmark and, and had it shipped over. Um, so it was a really beautiful European style grand piano. And I somehow just have this clear memory of that moment was the epiphany of, ah, this is who I am. This is what I will do. Even though there still has always been this like, oh, maybe I should have been an architect. But anyway, (laughs) never did go that route. I think we all have those like alternative careers. Like this doesn't work out. Mine was a librarian. I was going to be a librarian and I was for one summer and it I didn't like it. Oh, really? Because I was just alone by myself in an office. And I said, I need to be around people. (laughs) Right. That makes sense. But this librarian side of like doing the research that that's the part that you've, you've kept. And I also just get really jazzed from 
looking th- looking into this whole world of yeah women who actually composed and that's something that you and I have in common I think the amount of people that told me have you talked to Sandra Mopinson yet have you <laughs> listened to piano music she wrote have you heard of them yes I've heard of them you know because our, our paths are so intertwined yeah, in exactly that. I think our commitment to playing women in music sort of evolved around the same, around time. The same time. And then exactly. we connected during the pandemic and I'm so glad that we did. Yeah, absolutely. And someday we will actually meet in person. That'll be even more exciting. Yes, ah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, that uh, focus on, on, on women uh, who composed I tend to say that rather than women composers. I don't know. I I feel like they're just composers. So Mm -hmm. I I struggle a little bit with what the language should be around that. Uh, In German, it's handy because you have a female version of the word composer, same in French and Spanish. Anyway, so uh, I think like it's so great that you've come to it already in, in your stage of life. I have only come to it in, well, I'm not going to say how old I am, but, uh, you know, it's taken me (laughs) decades, uh, to get to this point. I think it was in about 2018 when I started to question, wait a minute, this thing we've been led to believe, uh, women, nah, they didn't really compose. If they did, it was kind of not really worth, it was really only about 2018 when I was reading a couple of biographies of Clara Schumann Mm. that, that I started to question that and like talk about slow. Uh, But anyway, I'm embarrassed at how many decades I bought that story. Um, Yeah. And so then it was in 2019 that I just went full in. Yeah. No, this is my mission. So I don't know Mm -hmm. if that's similar timing to you, maybe around there. Yeah. I I was in my undergrad Mm -hmm. as I was finishing up my undergrad I had a prof pull me into her office and she said, do you realize that you only talk about women composers? And she goes, there's something there for you. So, so, you know, keep, keep going on that path. And then I was in a piano literature course and um, our, our mutual colleague, Brett Kingsbury. And um, I, I told him, I said, Brett, there needs to be more women in your, in your course. And he goes, you're right. (laughs) <laughs> and so and so um you know him and I had lots of good discussions that I I presented several times on on women mm-hmm. composers in women composers women who composed I also struggle with that language and I'm curious if you've come to a decision on on how to address that because the problem is is the algorithm in library databases in ah. Spotify you know, playlists in Instagram data, I guess, Mm -hmm. um, or algorithms, I suppose is it doesn't show up like women who compose does not show up as often as women composers. Oh, that makes me more cynical than ever. I want to highlight them because Mm -hmm. they were basically erased. Wait, I'm, I just want to say first, I'm talking mostly from, for my, um, focus composers that lived back in the day yeah I, I have thanks to my mother who is a really good piano teacher and she was very um strong on teaching her students contemporary composers mm-hmm. and she would have little events for her students featuring Canadian composers so I was very aware that yes women of course like that was never a question. Women were amongst the, the contemporary composers that we focused on from, from day one or year three of life. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, my, my focus has become more about, uh, not that I'm not interested in contemporary music, uh, but just on these women that were, were erased. Uh, they, were, they were there. They were super successful, many of them, superstars. And then... Why? What? What happened? Who's responsible for that? So um, anyway, back to the what to call them. Uh, I just want to call them composers. Yet I want to highlight them because they were undeservedly overlooked. So 
Yeah, I think we just need a word in English like componistin. Right. Composeresses. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's not going to work. When I was uh, publishing my my book, I went back mm-hmm. and forth with the publisher on whether or not we call them women composers mm-hmm. in the title of the book because I didn't want to. Right. But again, it went back to that like library algorithm. Ah, yes. We needed to be able to identify. Right. Good point. And so... I agree with you. We need, we need a word, which I would just like to use composer because yeah, exactly. You know, we're not defined by gender. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like saying something like in English, it, it, when you add like et on the end, it just lowers the, the value right away. I, Whereas I in, in, in German, no, it's just, it just is a composer is a, either a male version or a female version. Yeah, so that's that's a tricky one. And I would just say, um, I found it really interesting in 2019, uh, when I sort of had my epiphany in January, uh, whoa, look at all this music that these women wrote. Uh, I have to do a recording. And so I, I started planning the recording and I started to, of course, envision the cover and the title and everything, En Pleine Lumière. And I was gonna have a subtitle, uh, music by women composers, but by, July or August, when I was putting together the the graphics with the designer and everything, I was like, no, 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 this is this is not even needed anymore. Clearly, if you look at the composers' names, you'll probably surmise that they're they're female. But I, I don't say anything about that. Just piano music by composers born in the mid nineteenth century. That's my subtitle. So for sure, yeah, artistic. But yeah, maybe maybe I'm losing out on some algorithm action. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> so now you you've mentioned it earlier you are also the co-founder of piano music she wrote which focuses on the piano compositions by women that are available in public domain mm-hmm. can you tell us more about that project and how yeah. it came about um and and about your co-founder as well yeah definitely so piano music she wrote originated in uh, the spring of 2020, and I guess you can guess why. Um, the, the En Plein Lumière project had meant to be going from volume one to volume two, three, four, five, six, uh, covering the whole of musical history from mid 19th century. That was meant to be going ahead that spring, but um, especially because I was uh, working with a producer in Germany, because uh, I wanted to work with a female producer, and I found an amazing one in Germany. There was no way to to travel to <laughs> Germany in early 2020, and I just started to despair. What? This is my mission. I know that I have to be focusing on this now, and yet the recording project is definitely on hold until the world uh, allows so how can I accomplish this, um, this mission of shining light on women who composed? Um, so in discussion with my friend Erica Sipes, who I had um, had a friendship over Twitter for a good 10, 12 years, um, and then met just before the pandemic, I was uh, on a concert tour and among other places was down in Virginia where she is. So in meeting her in person, we started to really talk about, hey, we should collaborate on something. And then once the pandemic locked down and everything happened, then we we talked further and said, hey, why don't we why don't we do this? Like this would be a way to bring um, this music, piano music written by women to a wider audience. The, the issue with uh, especially early in 2019 and even in 2020, it was so difficult to find scores. Either just they don't exist or they're super expensive or they're out of print or, you know, very difficult. And uh, many scores you see that that they exist. You can do the research and say, oh, that composer wrote that, 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 that. Or you can see, hey, this is Opus 56, where is uh, Opus 1 to 55? Like, it does. this is the only thing I see. So um, it was really uh, important to us both that we help pianists and anyone really 
find the scores so that the music could be played and performed and taught. So we started with IMSLP. Um, at the time, there was a little period of time there, a year and a half or so, where I was fairly nomadic and uh, I wasn't carrying around scores. So IMSLP was perfect, just so dumped into my iPad. So I was very kind of in the in the mindset of IMSLP, all pub, public domain and free. So we decided to go through the whole thing. It's very tricky to do a search in IMSLP for piano music composed by women composers. So we thought, let's, let's highlight that. So we went through the whole thing. I started at A and uh, she started at Z. Well, I guess she would call it Z. And we were able to find a list in IMSLP of women composers, but that included every single, everything they wrote, not just piano music. So that was as far as the, the search uh, engine in IMSLP would go. So I started at A, she started at Z, and we uh, met, actually, weirdly, we met at G, even though we did kind of about a half and half. And we went through every single uh, composer listed there and tracked down the piano music and made this massive uh, directory called the PMSW directory to um, all the piano music found on, on MSLP. And then from there, we uh, that took us months, by the way. Massive job. Not exactly thrilling to sit and do that kind of work. No. As you know, <laughs> that kind of thing can be very <laughs> tedious, but always this uh, thrilling idea behind it, like, whoa, this music is going to be played more now. At least that was our hope. And so then from there, we, you know, as we went, we noticed certain pieces that uh, we highlighted, and put a star beside for ourselves, and then started to record um, and started our YouTube channel in August of 2020. And the idea is each of us, both Erica and I, uh, have a video recording released every week of some piece of music from that directory, from my MSLP. So exciting, the discoveries. We've found so much incredible music. I think we've now, we're up to maybe close to 300 videos over that time. And some interviews with the likes of Olivia Adams, for example. <laughs> yeah, so there's that. And then that became a, an, an interest of mine to put out a couple of books for elementary level students, because I think that's an area where, yes, we have plenty of contemporary composers who are women um, for, for the early levels. But um, I was really interested in finding historical music. So, so that came out uh, December. Yeah, so soon after Loud and Clear. Uh, the book. Yes. Right after. And, and uh, Sandra and I also share a publisher. So that was, yes, exactly. that was neat because I got to put some of the music that Sandra, that I knew was coming out into yeah. loud and clear, which was, was great. Cause yeah, a little really, bit of a sneak peek. <laughs> very cool. How that lined up that we both, we were both in touch with that uh, lovely publisher, Deborah Wallace around the same time. So yeah, that worked mm -hmm. out nicely. I find it so interesting that you said, you know, spring of, of 2020 was when you and Erica started creating that mm. incredible database. And if you have not checked it out, you absolutely should, because um, it's become an invaluable resource for me Wonderful. personally. But when you were creating that, that database, I was also creating my database of 20th and 21st century right. uh, women composers. And so I just, I find it so uh, funny or I don't know, fateful th how the timelines yeah, lined up exactly, um, and our project sort of released at the same time. So between the three of us, we've covered, you know, quite a few of the centuries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, that you, you kind of focus more on the time period after which our project, because m most of the things that are in public domain in IMSLP are are not written uh, in that time Earlier. period that you covered. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's just so yeah. exciting. And, uh, yeah, that we seem to have connections here and there. That's really For cool. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's say that there is a pianist who wants to begin playing with and engaging with your work um, and playing more music by women. What do you suggest they begin with? Do they start with the database? Do they start with the YouTube channel, the books? 
where, where would you start? Oh, well, all of the above, obviously. <laughs> no, um, I, I guess it kind of depends on what kind of uh, situation that, that, what kind of pianist, what kind of level, what kind of age group. We did build the YouTube and are continuing to build the YouTube channel because we have a, an awareness that many uh, pianists like to hear the music before they play it. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the shopping for a new piece doesn't necessarily happen by looking at scores as it does for me. I, I tend to not listen to a piece of music. I just get it and open it and play it. Um, me too. <laughs> yeah. But I think many people like to hear it first and not that that never happens with me. Like if I hear something spectacular, then I'll, then I'll search it out. But um, I think that's a starting point for a lot of people, especially students. So that could be step one for someone like that. But if you're, if you're kind of like uh, you or, or I uh, who like to read music, sight read, I think just dive into the directory and just say, you know, kind of any mini, I'll choose this one and just go from there and see where, where one thing leads to the next, to the next, to the next. I mean, that was my discovery process of just kind of uh, leaping into the, the data, the, the MSLP website and, Oh, okay. What's this? And then from there, go to the next, the next thing that shows up. But of course there's also for young students or not necessarily young students, but students at an elementary level. Most of my students are adult students. That's why I say that. Um, uh, You know, these two books are at the elementary level, early elementary and late elementary. And over the course of those two books, there are about 40, 42 pieces, I think, um, in levels preparatory one, two, three, and four. And coming, hopefully, by the fall, will be the next level intermediate level so excited about it so that was like a very not committed answer because i i do think all of those roots are valid obviously that's why we built them you know so it it really depends on absolutely like i like you said i like to start with with sight reading so for me what i did when i accessed your database i was like I need a piece for 20th century and I wanted a South American Uh composer. So that was kind of how I reduced my search. It was easy to find 20th century South American. Okay, cool. And I just downloaded a bunch of scores. I sight read through them, you know, just to see, okay, what, what kind of music can I play? And then for students, I have one student in particular that is extremely picky about what music they play. Oh, wow. And, (laughs) and so when I've exhausted you know, the music that I have in my catalog, I have told the student, okay, go to piano music. She wrote and go to this playlist and just have a listen through and see what you find on the YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah. On the YouTube channel. Yeah. We have plenty of playlists there by nationality, by level, by uh, etudes, forehands. Uh, So yeah, there's, there's lots of ways in. So I hope that gives every kind of pianist some kind of way of starting. Absolutely. And whether you're starting with a teacher or you're just starting Mm -hmm. on your own and for your own interests. Now you've talked about it already, but you've got books for sale of compositions by women, including some of your own arrangements. So -hmm. can you tell us about those and where you can get them and how those came about? That would be wonderful. Well, you can get them at pianomusicshewrote.com directly from us, or you can get them from uh, deborahwallace.com also, I think. Um, So yeah, I decided to add some of my own arrangements to these books because I felt that there were some composers that should definitely be represented, but maybe hadn't really written anything for elementary level. So that would mean, uh, for example, Agatha Bakker Grindal, the great Norwegian, um, in the second book, Teresa Carreño as well, uh, have a little arrangement. Um, I wanted to put uh, Canadian content that's in this second book, the late elementary. And, um, but there's nothing public domain really. 
Canadian, right? Because they're more recent. So then I was like, hey, this is really a cool thing. There was a composer named Laura Lemon. She was born in Guelph, Ontario, and in 1866. So one year before Confederation. <laughs> she moved to Winnipeg in her childhood. And then in her 20s, I think, she her, she went to England and that was where she stayed. But she was really well known for this one song in uh, her English career, a song. So very popular song called My Ain Folk. And I just think it's such a beautiful little melody. It's so beautiful. And uh, I thought, hey, that could be a nice little piece to arrange for, for this level. So yeah, things like that I, I thought I would add so that um, we're covering kind of the whole gamut uh, style-wise, starting with early Baroque with Jacques de la Guerre and taking us into the 20th century with one, one of the composers still living from Chile, who I encountered through my uh, friend Rosa Vergara. So she introduced me to this composer, Iris Sanguesa. So there's a, there's a real range style-wise. Um, of course, tempo, key, all those things you need to balance things out so that there's not a lot of same same through it so that was really a fun process yeah and uh, I think for the for the intermediate which is now underway putting those little dots into finale uh, there might be one or two arrangements again just to cover something that that wouldn't otherwise have shown up at that level I was really excited by the covers I, maybe this doesn't matter to some people, but so far, the first two and now in the third, I have found a painting by the Norwegian painter Harriet Bakker, who happened to be the sister of Agatha Bakker Grindal, the great composer. And these, each of these paintings show a person at the piano in a really cozy atmosphere surrounding them. And I just, yeah, I was really drawn to those those paintings. So that's part of it as well, featuring also a, a woman who painted. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And the covers really are beautiful. The collections are beautiful. I will link to purchase them in for, you know, people who want to purchase them. Thank I'll you. link those in the show notes so that they're available. And, um, they're just fantastic resources. One thing I love is that you have these little descriptors of the composers mm. so that the students can learn about them. They can learn, okay, what does this title mean? Because often it's in another language. Right. And so, and then two, as I have, um, I have some students that are, are, are Costa Rican. And so when I showed them this book, they immediately picked out the you know, this, this Spanish sounding, Oh, I'm going to play that piece. Cause I know what that word means. And I know what, yeah, and, and so awesome. they just, it was so exciting to see their faces just light up. Bijou is one of your arrangements right. is a favorite in my studio I'm for learning. Cuban. Yeah. Yes. It's such uh, a fun. fun piece. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, that was really part of it too, to, to try to find the variety internationally, you know, cover mm -hmm as many continents as possible and, and such, you know, it's very easy to end up with a whole book of European composers, but um, yes. Yeah. I wanted to go wider than that. Yeah. So there's actually a, a Japanese woman. There's nothing that I've really found about her or from her other than a beautiful uh, violin piece. For, mm. um, so I just made a little arrangement of that. It's a very lovely little melody so, yeah it's yeah. beautiful it's really beautiful now I am dying to know is when are these new books coming out and are there more past three volumes are you planning to go all the way to advance because there's <sighs> such a valuable resource mm -hmm. and um there's so, something I really appreciated about the publications is that there was so much care into the fingering the phrasing mm. the descriptions Thank it was you. done with Good. like an incredible amount of research and thoughtfulness about who was going to be playing that Good. um so Thank can you, you let us know my intention and hope is to continue for sure I can never speak for the publisher of course because there are many factors involved in in publishing music that are beyond me so we're starting with one at a time I think 
yeah, my vision is for, um, in terms of Canadian levels, my vision is for sure to get it up to about grade eight or nine, level H nine. I think past that level, it's much easier to sort of find your own stuff. So yeah, that's, that's the hope one thing at a time and stay tuned. (laughs) Wonderful. So uh, what else are you working on right now and what's getting you excited? What a nice question. Well, I just last week uh, had the opportunity to play uh, a live concert for the first time since pre pandemic. And that was a program that I'm very excited about and would like to play elsewhere, bring to wider audiences and that's a program called of love and everything and it's all music of black women composers interspersed with the poetry of another black woman named mari evans and i got a wonderful actress uh, named yana mcintosh to collaborate with me on it we first did the program virtually in february of 2021 And then uh, we were asked by the Stratford Festival to do it in real life in a brand new theater. So that was very exciting. That was just last week. Uh, Features music of, uh, of course, Florence Price. There's a a good sort of solid chunk of her her music in the middle of that, uh, really highlighting, showcasing her. Uh, There are also several pieces of Betty Jackson King. Love her. Um, Julia Perry. Who, with whom I share an alma mater. She and I both went to Westminster Choir College in Princeton, New Jersey. So I find that super exciting to have that connection with her. Uh, very difficult to find her music, but mm-hmm. there are a couple of pieces by her. Uh, those sweet little jazz pieces by Valerie Capers. I know you're aware of those are in your yes. book. Um, and uh, Regina Alberga, a UK composer. There's a fun piece, crazy piece um, called Fizz. And there is a piece by Regina harris Bayaki, who's also a poet herself. Um, who else? Oh, yes. And Zenobia Powell Perry. Lovely stuff. So those, I think, seven composers. And, and it, it just thrilled me to put that program together. Uh, originally for February of last year, but also I further expanded it for this show, uh, how the poetry and the music are just so in sync. It's like the poet knew that I was going to need to have a poem to set me up to play that piece. It's just uncanny how, how beautifully it goes together. And um, yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful writer, Mari Evans. And yeah, the audiences both times that have done it were very, very excited. It's all music that you would rarely, if ever, hear. So it's a nice opportunity to, to present it all. So yeah, I would love to get out there and <laughs> perform that some more. I, of course, still have En Plein Lumière, the, the next volume. I, I'm planning to do uh, volumes two and three, hopefully in one big set of recording sessions. I'm planning that and still plans not completely gelled. So, but that's hopefully going to be within the next half a year or so. Wonderful. Well, yeah. thanks so much. It has been such a pleasure getting to chat with you. We're going to wrap up our chat with a few rapid fire questions that Uh-oh. I'm asking everybody in this season. So <laughs> there are no wrong answers. Just go with your gut. And if okay. you want to pass on a question, just let me know. Okay. Um, <laughs> can you point to a moment? And I think you, you've already touched on this. Um, can you point to a moment when you knew you wanted to be a musician? Right. Yeah, I, I still, I just have this visual memory of that moment of, I don't remember what I was playing at the time when I was age 15, but I, I can just picture the, the moment of, ah, this is it. And I, I can't really tell you why it happened at that moment, or, but it was just a, a knowing, yeah. Favorite piece or song to perform? Oh my goodness can't have favorites so hard I know it's right? like having a favorite <laughs> child um okay so currently ah uh, ah uh, okay um 
I just found, this is so small, but I just found um, on YouTube, in fact, some pianist, and I can't remember who it was, playing a piece called Prelude, Prelude, maybe Opus 10, by Mel Bonis, is one page. It's so, so beautiful. Just one page, arpeggio, left hand. And I can play it on a loop. I just, ah, oh, it's so sweet, so beautiful. But like, that's just because that's going around in my head right now that I'm saying that. But there's, there have been a lot of favorites that have come out of the Piano Music She Wrote project. I, in fact, want to do a post soon about like my five favorites and Erica's five favorites and, and then maybe get some engagement from others to find out what, what their favorites are. What their are. favorites are. Yeah. That's great. I love it. So what is the worst musical or career advice you've ever been given? Ah, okay. Well, I would say in general, I wouldn't specifically cite a moment, but I think anything, any time one is told, given advice that is kind of against who you really are, mm -hmm. I think those are the things that you need to just chuck. No, not listening to that. Like, for example, for me, one thing has been, uh, oh, you need to choose. Are you, are you a solo pianist or are you uh, an accompanist for singers? You need to you need to choose which area you want to really focus on because doing both no 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 and I, for a while I kind of considered that oh okay hmm I kind of see your point no that's not it that's not who I am I need singers and I need to play solo that's both of those things are me so I think anything that that is against who you are and and further to that I really feel like now this uh kind of epiphany of oh wow women compose music that I really love I feel like that now has enabled me or allowed me to become more of who I am as a pianist yeah somehow resonate deeply with with those pieces so I love that I love that. It's a great answer. Um, what's the best musical or career advice that you can pass on to up and coming musicians? Mm. Okay, let's see. Well, it could be that, like the flip side of, of that in a way. Like I think truly it's taken me a number of decades, but I think truly it's so important to, to um, figure out who you are um not do the shoulds I mean sure you have to build your technique you have to have your tools in place and that is a certain amount of discipline and shoulds of course but um as far as your expression of, of what kind of pianist you want to be or what kind of musician or what kind of creative person you want to be I think you have to you have to create from who you truly are not not copying or not uh, not not doing something because someone said no don't do that um, if you're like super jazzed by ragtime piano and don't want to play Bach well maybe you should play a little bit Bach anyway but um, <laughs> <laughs> never gonna diss Bach never he's the man but um like do it like go yes. full on in onto ragtime or whatever it is that that jazzes you so I think I think that's at the essence of, of where I come from as a, as a performer, as a creative person and as a pedagogue. Yeah. I love that. And uh, last question is what are you listening to right now? Oh, well, I have to honestly say that I don't listen to very much music because I've always got something spinning around that's in my head. That's shocking me. I know it is. It's, very unusual for me to listen to music in my uh off hours uh a because I'm, I'm hearing music in my head all the time um b I sometimes do need silence but if I'm listening to something if I were to go upstairs and choose to blast something on speakers I would probably put on Keith Jarrett yeah. Wonderful. I mean, That's great. I, 
if I have any regrets, it was why did I not become a jazz pianist? That's <laughs> that's more my, yeah. So I, I would listen to something that's not something that I would end up listening to analytically. I sometimes feel like when I'm listening to classical piano music that it's almost a distraction. And so mm. when I'm when I'm working on something, yeah, it's I don't choose to listen to classical piano music. So I'm with you there. Yeah. No, I, I tend to be like not able to have music on in the background because I'm I'm listening at such a level of you know analysis and critical and yeah, it's not very good. So yeah, <laughs> silence is sure. golden. Silence. <laughs> Uh, I love that. Uh, So thanks so much, Sandra, for coming on loud and clear. Can you let our audience know where they can find you? And I will also link to all of your um, socials in the, and your website in the show notes. Well, thank you. I I so enjoyed talking with you and yeah, I tend to love talking about myself. It seems. Um, Okay. So, well, there's sandramogensen.com, which is easy. If you know how to spell Mogensen. There's piano music she wrote.com. Uh, so there's those two websites. There are YouTube channels for both uh, piano music she wrote and for Sandra Mogensen. I believe my YouTube channel personally is called Mogan Pianist. And then on Instagram is where I'm most active. So I run the piano music she wrote Instagram and as well uh, the En Plein Lumière Instagram. There's Twitter. Uh, Sandra Mogensen Mm -hmm. and piano music she wrote Twitter is run by my colleague Erica who's I just have to shout her out she's such a good pianist so good to work with on this so yeah you'll enjoy hearing her if you haven't already checked out her YouTube videos yeah those are the main ones I guess there's a Facebook thing but I'm less thank you so much Sandra for coming on the podcast it's been such a delight to chat with you Um, I hope I hope we can again sometime. And there you have it. That is my interview with Sandra Mogensen. I hope you enjoyed it. I will have links to all of the references if you go to oamusicstudios.ca slash podcast. Make sure you go and give Piano Music She Wrote a follow and let Sandra know how much you enjoyed the show. To close out this episode, we will listen to Sandra's beautiful recording of Louise Adolfa Lebeau's D-flat major prelude, opus 12, number six. Thank you to the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra for sponsoring this podcast. Make sure you head over to saskatoonsymphony.org to purchase tickets for upcoming shows. And if you don't live in the Saskatoon area, you can watch these shows via concert stream by following the link at the top of the website. I'm your host, Olivia Adams, and you can find me at OA Music Studios on socials and oamusicstudios.ca. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. And here is Sandra Mogensen with Louise Adolfa Lebeau's D-flat major prelude.